Hi everyone, this is going to be lesson number six on the topic of cells for students of GCSE Biology. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at the various ways in which tr substances are transported across the membranes of cells, uh, and this is going to include diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. So let's take a look at the learning objectives for this lesson. So by the time you have completed this teaching video, and also if you're watching this teaching video on my website, on its lesson page, the embedded pop-up questions that will appear. And also once you've attempted the other learning activities on that lessons page, including the end of lesson quiz, you should be able to do the following things. So we need to start by talking about the uh, significance of the transport of substances. Why is it required and why do cells require the movement into and out of cells of various substances, including nutrients, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and so on. And then we're going to go on to distinguish between the definitions of these three different modes of transport across membranes, diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. Uh, we're also going to spend some time talking about the significance of surface area to volume ratio and then go on to describe the factors which affect the rate of diffusion and um, osmosis. So these are the things that you should be able to do by the time you've completed all of those learning activities. And as always, if you're logged in and uh, registered for this course, you should be able to go to that page and enter any questions that you may have either on the live chat, or you can ask your questions privately by sending me a private message. Typically, I'll respond to private messages within about 24 hours. Now, if you are watching this elsewhere, such as on YouTube, then you can always type your questions in to the comments and I'll do my best to get back to you there as soon as possible as well. So um, let's take a look at the uh, general principles here. So cells are surrounded by a plasma membrane or a cell membrane and its function, its main function, is to selectively control the rate of movement of certain substances into and out of the cell. So we, sell that, we say that cell membranes in general are selectively or partially permeable. Permeable means that a material or a sheet of material will allow substances to pass through it. Uh, if that material is impermeable, it means that whatever the substance you're considering cannot pass through that, uh, that material. So cell membranes, plasma membranes, are selectively permeable. So here we have an amoeba, a single-celled organism, and we have the plasma membrane which surrounds the amoeba. Now, the amoeba, being an organism, has certain requirements, certain substances that it needs continuously to support its living processes, substances like oxygen and nutrients, for example. Now, since this is a single-celled organism, the only means by which this organism can obtain those nutrients and oxygen is by movement from the surroundings via the cell membrane into the cytoplasm of that cell. So, um, in contrast, the amoeba also produces waste products from its metabolism, and this would, this would include things like carbon dioxide. Now, if those waste products were allowed to build up inside this amoeba, uh, and the concentration of those substances went too high, then those substances would be poisonous to the organism. And so it needs to get rid of these waste products. And again, it does so by means of transport of those substances from inside the cell, through the cell membrane, to the external environment. So this means overall that the cell membrane not only has to be permeable in both directions to certain substances, it has to be able to control the rate of movement of those substances in either direction. <clears throat> so there are three main ways, there are three main mechanisms by which uh, substances can move through the membrane in either direction. And these are the ones that we mentioned before, diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. So let's start with diffusion then. Water molecules, which are in constant motion all the time, will collide and intermingle with each other in the course of that motion. So if we take a beaker of water here and add a drop of ink to that container, we'll find that the ink will slowly spread through the water uh, and this is due to the collisions between the mov moving water molecules and the molecules of the ink. This causes the ink molecules to move randomly from where they started until eventually the ink will be distributed evenly through the whole volume of the liquid. Now this process of random motion from a region where molecules are in high concentration to a region where they are in low concentration is called diffusion. So. The definition of diffusion is the random motion of molecules from a region where they're in high concentration to a region where they're in low concentration. Now this can happen 
such as in the example that I've just shown, it can also happen from one side of a membrane to another. So if we want to give a nice rigorous definition for the term diffusion, here would be a good way of uh, wording it. Diffusion is the net movement of water molecules down their concentration gradient from a region where they're in higher concentration to a region where they're in lower concentration. Now the direction and also the rate of net flow of molecules is related to, uh, among other things, the difference in concentration from where from one side of the membrane to another. This is called the concentration gradient. So the, di the greater the difference in concentration, then the faster the rate of diffusion. So this is illustrated here by this animation that we're seeing here. So you'll notice that even though there's a larger number of molecules starting on this side than on this side, you'll notice that it doesn't necessarily mean that the rate, the movement is all from the left to the right. On occasion, you will get molecules moving from the right to the left. It's the net movement, the overall movement of molecules, uh, which is, um, is, is what we're measuring when we're measuring the rate of diffusion. So in this case, the net movement is from where the molecules started in high concentration to where they were in low concentration. Now this continues until eventually the concentration on either side of the membrane is equal and there is no further net movement. This means that at this point there is still movement in both directions but the rate at which molecules are moving from right to left and from left to right across the membrane is equal so there is no net movement. Now diffusion is actually illustrated very well by another one of these animations from the PHET website. This one is titled Diffusion and you can find this if you just type in PHET and the word simulation into Google. It'll be the first result that comes up and you'll be able to find many simulations like these which are very useful for understanding physical and chemical and biological processes. So what we have here is a box which is partitioned down the middle. So let's imagine that we put let's say 50 particles on this side and we put 50 particles on the right. Now when we remove this partition at the moment these particles are in the gas phase but this uh, diffusion applies to all fluids whether they're liquids or solid uh, liquids or gases because the particles in a liquid or a gas are able to move translationally in straight lines until they either collide with another particle or with the walls of their container, they are essentially moving randomly such that diffusion can occur. So if I remove the divider now, we can see that particles will move randomly. And so eventually what we'll find is if given enough time, on average, there will be the same number of particles of each type, the blue and the red ones, on the left side as on the other. Now, the rate of diffusion will increase uh, the faster the particles are moving on average. And so if we were to increase the average temperature on the left and on the right, then we would find eventually um, that the diffusion would occur more rapidly. So you can see here that just by random movement alone, we're going to end up with approximately equal numbers of particles on the left and on the right. Now I'd encourage you guys to have a play around with this simulation. I will embed it onto the lesson page for this lesson on my website and you'll be able to interact with these various different uh, parameters and see what the effect is on the rate of diffusion. But it's essentially the same process that we're talking about when we're talking about diffusion across a biological membrane such as a cell membrane. So what types of particles can diffuse? Well, it's really only the fluids. It's only liquids and gases. And the reason for this is that in the gas and the liquid state, the particles are able to move translationally in straight lines until they bounce off another particle or they bounce off the walls of their container. In the solid state, they are locked into average positions about which they move vibrationally, not translationally. And for this reason, gases and liquids are able to diffuse and solids are not. Now, typically, the rate of diffusion of a gas is going to be higher than uh, the rate of diffusion of a liquid. And, for, and the reason for this is that if you take, for example, liquid uh, ethanol, um, the, the particles of liquid ethanol are moving at a particular speed. But if you, look, if you compare that to ethanol gas, uh, the particles are typically moving more rapidly and therefore will diffuse more rapidly. So let's move on to osmosis now. Osmosis is a special kind of diffusion. It is 
the random movement of particles and it is the random movement of those particles from a region where they're in high concentration to a region where they're in low concentration but in this case osmosis specifically relates to the movement of water molecules so uh, where you have water in high concentration versus water in low concentration because it has things dissolved in it the movement of water molecules will be from where they are in high concentration to where they are in low concentration now osmosis also is different from diffusion in the sense that it must happen through a partially or selectively permeable membrane now as we saw with the animation that i just showed you diffusion can happen without a membrane being present or it can happen through the membrane of a cell like a cell membrane but Osmosis is defined as the random movement of water molecules from a region where the water molecules are in high concentration to a region where the water molecules are in low concentration through a partially permeable membrane. So in order for it to be osmosis, the particles have to be water molecules and they have to be moving through a partially permeable membrane. <clears throat> so we have to distinguish between the concentration of water molecules and the concentration of a solution. When you make an aqueous solution, you are dissolving a solute in water. So normally when we measure the concentration of an aqueous solution, we are measuring the number of particles of the solute per unit of volume, not the number of particles of water. So on this side of the membrane, we have a solution of the solute particles dissolved in water. On this side, we have pure water, just the water molecules alone. Now, we would describe this as a relatively, compared to this side, a high concentration of solution because we're measuring, when we say that, we're referring to the concentration of the solute particles. Concentration is a measure of the number of particles of something there are in every unit of volume of something. So if we're measuring the concentration of a solution, such as a sugar solution, we're actually measuring the number of particles of sugar per unit of volume. So obviously, in that context, we have a more concentrated solution on this side than on this side. But osmosis refers to the concentration gradient of water molecules. So clearly on this side, with respect to water molecules, we have a higher concentration of water than on this side. So I want you guys to remember that a the higher the concentration of a solution is, the lower the concentration of water molecules in that solution. So. In this example, the glucose molecules are too large to pass through the plasma membrane that separates these two uh, liquids here. So we have a partially permeable membrane here, but the pore size, the membrane itself, is uh, does not allow the movement of sugar molecules through it. The pores, on the other hand, are large enough to allow the passage of water molecules and so the water molecules will move from the right hand side here where they are in high concentration to the left hand side here where the water molecules are in low concentration by osmosis so this is what we might see so again we're measuring net movement here some water molecules do move from left to right but far more water molecules move by random motion from right to left so the net movement of water by osmosis is from right to left in this example now we can use a device called an osmometer to demonstrate the process of osmosis so what we have here is a uh, beaker filled with pure water within this we have a partially permeable membrane surrounding a sugar solution and we have a very thin glass tube called a capillary tube inserted into the top of this sugar solution so if we set this up we would expect the water molecules to move from the beaker where they are in high concentration via, through the partially permeable membrane into the sugar solution inside this uh, membrane here where the water molecules are in low concentration now when this happens we would witness the water level the liquid level in the capillary tube rising and the reason for this is that water molecules are moving in to the inside of this partially permeable membrane by osmosis so just remember that even though the osmosis is defined as the net movement of water molecules from where the water molecules are in high concentration to low concentration, the key term there is net. Water molecules do move in both directions. However, more of them move from high concentration of water to low concentration of water than in the opposite direction. So overall, the movement of water is from here 
to here. So here's a question. What will happen if a strong sugar solution is separated from a weaker sugar solution by a partially permeable membrane which allows water but not sugar to pass through it? So I'm going to ask uh, this question to the students who are in attendance here. Imagine that we have a strong sugar solution here and we have a weak sugar solution here. Um, what would happen under these circumstances where this membrane separating these two solutions allows water molecules to move but does not allow sugar uh, molecules to move? What would, we, uh, what would we observe? What could we measure under these circumstances? So I'm going to pause here and let the students who are in attendance uh, type their answers into the chat box. Uh, if you're watching this on my website and you're logged in, um, the video will pause to allow you to answer this question. Uh, if you're watching elsewhere, such as YouTube, um, I'd suggest maybe pausing the video and seeing if you can answer this question before unpausing and seeing the solution here. Okay, so... Um... <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so it, it seems like uh, I'm getting some good responses here from the, uh, the students who are attending with me here. Just another few seconds, guys, and then we'll move on. <clears throat> All right, good. So let's have a look at um, a good way of phrasing this. So remember, we're dealing with a strong or highly concentrated solution of sugar and a lower concentration of sugar on the left-hand side or a more dilute solution. So uh, if this has more sugar molecules in it than this and they both have the same volume, then you would expect to have fewer water molecules here than here. And so the water concentration is higher here in the dilute solution than in the strong sugar solution. And so by osmosis, the net movement of water will, from, will be from the more dilute solution to the more concentrated solution. So this flow again is called osmosis. So I, I mentioned this just because, um, again, you need to keep in mind that when we, when we say a concentrated sugar solution, for example, what we're saying is, there are a large number of sugar molecules per unit of volume. But this implies that there are relatively lower numbers of water molecules in the concentrated solution than in the dilute solution. So concentrated or dilute usually refers to the number of solute particles per unit of volume. And it doesn't refer to the number of water molecules. It's the opposite situation for the water molecules. The more concentrated the sugar solution is, the fewer water molecules you will have per unit of volume when compared to a more dilute solution. So if we were to do that experiment, if you do have a flow of water from the more dilute solution to the more concentrated solution, you would expect something like this to be observed. So here, this is the reason for this is that we're getting water being moved by osmosis from the more dilute solution where you have more water molecules per unit of volume to the less dilute or the stronger solution, the more concentrated solution. So there's a few examples of osmosis that you need to be familiar with. Uh, so the cellulose cell walls that surround plant cells are fully permeable. Now beneath the cellulose cell wall, there is of course the plasma membrane, which is, per, uh, which is partially permeable. So this is, an, this is a diagram which illustrates the, uh, the various organelles of a plant cell. Now some of these, uh, most of these we covered uh, in previous lessons here. So this means that all water molecules can cross the cellulose cell wall, but not all water molecules can cross the partially permeable membrane and enter the plant cell. So why does a plant cell swell up when it's placed in pure water? Well, the reason is that there is a higher concentration of water molecules outside than there are inside, and so water the net movement of water by osmosis will be into the cell via the fully permeable cell wall and the via the partially permeable cell membrane. And eventually the water will all flow into the large central vacuole, which stores that water in the cell sap. Now it flows through the vacuole membrane, which is called the tonoplast. So what we have here is a flow of water which actually exerts, a, uh, which causes the central vacuole to swell up. Now this then pushes outwards onto uh, 
uh, the contents of the cell. And this turgor pressure, as it's as it's known, uh, is what's responsible for the cells in the um, in the stem of the plant pushing against each other, and that provides rigidity to the plant. Um, and this is the reason why plants, when they're deprived of water, will lose this turgor pressure, and this will cause the stems to wilt. So the full explanation here is that there's a higher concentration of water molecules in the pure water outside the cell than there are in the cell contents. So consequently, water will move from the pure water, the less concentrated or weaker or dilute solution outside the cell into the plant cell where the water molecules are less concentrated. So within the plant, the cytoplasm and the cell sap in the uh, vacuole are more concentrated solutions of solutes and therefore have fewer water molecules per unit of volume than outside. So this causes the net movement of water molecules into the cell, which eventually cell, uh, will swell up. The, vac the vacuole then pushes outwards on the cellulose cell wall and the cellulose cell wall pushes back onto the membrane and the vacuole. So in this state, the cell is said to be turgid So conversely, why does a plant cell become flaccid or deflated when it's placed into a strong concentrated sugar solution? Well, in this case, we have the opposite thing happening. What happens is that the water molecules will move outwards by osmosis for the opposite reasons to in the previous situation. Eventually, this will cause the cytoplasm to shrink and also the central vacuole will shrink as well. Eventually, the, the cytoplasm will start to peel away from the inner surface of the cell walls. This is called plasmolysis and will eventually lead to the death of the cell. So the full explanation for that situation is that there is a higher concentration of water molecules in the cell contents than in the, in the strong sugar solution outside of the cell. So water will flow from the cell contents into the sugar solution by osmosis, and the water molecules pass across the partially permeable membrane, causing the cell to eventually deflate. And since the vacuole no longer pushes outwards on the uh, cellulose cell wall, the cellulose cell wall will no longer push back on the membrane and the vacuole. In this state, the cell is described as being plasmalized. So this is essentially what happens to the cells in the stem of a plant when it lacks sufficient water. And this, is, and this loss of the turgor pressure is what causes the plant eventually to wilt. So here we can see a primrose potted plant in its turgid state when it's got plenty of water. And we can compare this to what happens when the water uh, is not present in sufficient quantities to maintain the turgor of the cells. And here we can see that the leaves and also the flowers and the stems of the plant are flaccid, they are wilted. And this is entirely a consequence of either having turgid cells in the left-hand case or flaccid plasmalized cells in the right-hand case here. So we need to familiarize ourselves with some uh, key terms here. There are two key terms that you need to be familiar with, which are relative terms. So when you're comparing one solution of a certain concentration to another solution of a different concentration, one of them is hypotonic with respect to the other, and the other is hypertonic with respect to the first. A hypotonic solution is a solution with a lower concentration of solute, lower concentrations of particles dissolved in the water. So if we place plant cells in a hypotonic solution, these, for example, are onion cells which have been placed in a weak solution uh, of glucose. In other words, a solution which contains a low number of glucose molecules per unit of volume. However, this means that there's a relatively high concentration of water molecules per unit of volume. And so we see here that because of the movement of water, mo water molecules by osmosis into these cells, we have these fully turgid cells where we can see that the cell walls, uh, the cell membranes, are pushed up right up against the cell walls and the cells are fully turgid. They are bulging outwards and pushing on each other. Now, if we contrast this to um, a solution which contains the same number of uh, dissolved substances in the water as in the actual cells themselves, this is an isotonic solution. So isotonic means 
that when you have two solutions of the same concentration, they have the same number of dissolved particles per unit of volume and also the same number of water molecules per unit of volume as each other. So if we immerse these same cells in an isotonic solution, we can see that the, the membrane is just about beginning to pull away from the edges of the cell walls. Now, the reason for this is that in order for these cells to be turgid, fully turgid, there needs to be a movement of water molecules into them. But since these cells have the same concentration of water and dissolved substances inside them as in the external solution, there's no longer a net movement of water into these. So you're starting to see a little bit of plasmolysis here. Now, if we place those same cells in a hypertonic solution, a hypertonic solution is a solution containing more dissolved substances, solutes, per unit of volume than the other solution that you're comparing it to. So these onion cells have been immersed in a solution containing a high concentration of sugar and therefore a lower concentration of water than you find inside the cells themselves. So here we can see that these cells are plasmalized. The cell contents are very small, they're shrunken in comparison to the sizes of the cells. And you can actually see the cell membrane of this cell, for example, has peeled away from the cell walls. You can see it in this cell as well and in these cells over here. So this plant cell is bathed in a strong hypertonic sucrose solution where the concentration of water molecules surrounding the cell is low and we can see that due to the movement of water molecules out of the cell by osmosis the cell contents the cytoplasm shrinks and the cell membrane pulls away from the surrounding cell wall uh, and this is what we call plasmolysis so this next slide shows a magnified view of fully plasmalized onion cells So we can also demonstrate osmosis using cups made from whole potatoes. So we see these cup shapes which have been cut from whole potatoes. Within each one of these we have some sugar on the inner surface of the cup and in here we have uh, these potato cups containing the sugar sitting in water in these um, baths here. So let's observe this experiment here. Now, after three minutes, we see that this one has absorbed the water from the surrounding cup and has actually filled with that water. Whereas this one on the right, which was the boiled potato, this one was just a, an ordinary potato that has been carved into this uh, shape. And the one on the right here is a boiled potato. So we can see here that clearly osmosis has happened here. Um, because of the presence of the sugar here, the cells in the inner portion here are um, have less water content than the cells in the outer portion. And in any case, because this is pure water, pure water will move into these cells by osmosis and then will move through from one cell to another to the inner compartment here. So this demonstrates that osmosis is happening here. However, in the boiled potato, because you have disruption of the cells uh, structures, osmosis no longer happens um, at uh, an appreciable rate. And so this is the reason why you make these different observations of these two different um, experimental setups in this experiment. So we've been talking a lot about plant cells here. What about animal cells? Now, animal cells lack a cell wall, and as such, they're unable to withstand the uptake of too much water without bursting. So osmosis in animal cells can be investigated by placing samples of blood in different concentrations of salt solution. So here we can see red blood cells in this photomicrograph from a blood sphere, uh, smear. So in this, in this case, these cells are being bathed in the liquid portion of blood, which is called plasma. Now, blood plasma is actually a weak salt solution, which has the same concentration as the inter interior of these cells which are suspended in it. And so these cells have the characteristic um, biconcave disc shape. They're neither swollen up nor are they shrunken. They are all intact because the net movement of water into and out of these cells is zero. They are sitting in an isotonic solution of blood plasma. However, if we place uh, those same cells 
Instead of placing them in an isotonic solution, we put them in a hypertonic solution, such as a high concentration of salt solution, they will lose water by osmosis and they will shrink and form these irregular crenellated shapes. And so we say that um, this is, a, or rather we would observe this happening in a hypertonic solution. If on the other hand, we place these same red blood cells in a weaker solution of salt in a, in a more dilute solution than you find in blood plasma, they would gain water by osmosis and they would eventually swell up and eventually burst. This again um, would cause the death of these cells. So most soft drinks will contain water with dissolved substances such as sugars and also some ions such as potassium and sodium. So these ions are referred to as electrolytes. Now, many sports drinks will claim to be isotonic in the sense that they contain a similar concentration of dissolved substances to the ones that you find in your own cells. So, in a sports drink, the concentrations of ions and also sugars are set at specific values, and these concentrations are the ones which allow the body to most efficiently replace uh, firstly, the water and the ions which are lost during sweating, and also the sugars that are used up by skeletal muscles during exercise. Now, sweat is being produced even if it's not visible on the surface of the skin. It only becomes visible when the rate of sweating is, uh, is um, or the rate of the production of sweat by the sweat glands is greater than the rate of evaporation of the sweat from the skin. So if water and ions are lost by sweating were not replaced, then the body's ion and water balance would be disturbed and the cells would not be able to work at an optimum efficiency. So the goal of sports drinks is to promote effective rehydration, the reuptake of water to replace the water which has been lost by sweating. And this is important in delaying the onset of muscle fatigue during and after exercise. So most sports drinks have a similar concentration of ions and sugar to that found in body cells, and these are called isotonic for that reason. Again, isotonic is a comparative term. It's used to describe two solutions which have the same concentration. Now, in the case of these sports drinks, the ratio of glucose concentration to the ratio of ions has been shown to affect the rate at which the body takes in water from the drink, the rate of uh, rehydration. So the nearer the ratio between the concentration of glucose and the concentration of ions is to a one-to-one -one ratio, the faster the body rehydrates. Now, long-distance marathon runners, for example, will take isotonic drinks at regular intervals throughout the race to replace the ions and the water lost in their sweat. A regular boost to the sugar levels is also achieved by taking in these drinks at intervals throughout the race. Now, in addition to uh, the sugar replacing the sugars used up during the respiration of their muscle cells, it also helps to maximize the uptake of ions and water. Now, later on in this GCSE biology course, we're going to be looking at the role of the kidneys in regulating the amount of water present in your body tissues and your tissue fluids. This is called osmoregulation. But for now, we need to kind of summarize uh, the importance of osmosis in that process. So, for example, after you take a large drink of water, the contents of your blood have a higher amount of water per unit of volume than they did before you took that large drink of water. So we can say that the blood has become more dilute than normal. Now your body detects this and releases a hormone called antidiuretic hormone or ADH into your blood. Now when your blood becomes more dilute, less ADH is released into the blood. Now this hormone affects the tissues of the kidneys by causing them to excrete more water into the urine and out of the blood. And this has a negative feedback effect where the original rise in water concentration is corrected by reducing the amount of water in your blood back to the normal level. So on average, the average adult human being should be drinking about 1.7 liters of water per day to regulate their water levels and stay healthy. But this increases uh, in hot, dry weather. So we've taken a look at osmosis, we've taken a look at diffusion, let's now take a look at active transport. Now some animal and plant cells can absorb substances across the membrane, uh, the plasma membrane, 
in the opposite direction to their concentration gradients. In other words, uh, from a dilute solution to a more concentrated one. Now, this process is called active transport because it actually requires energy from respiration in the form of ATP. Now, this means that more of a substance which is needed for a particular cell's uh, functioning can be absorbed than by passive diffusion alone. So active transport enables cells to absorb, for example, ions from a very dilute solution or to recover those which are needed for the organism's function, even in very small amounts. So plants need to absorb a variety of mineral ions to keep them alive. Plants need things like magnesium to make chlorophyll, nitrate ions to provide nitrogen for proteins. And so these ions are necessary for various uh, biomolecules which are essential for the functioning of these plant cells. Now the source of ions such as Mg2 plus and the nitrate ion is usually in the water surrounding the soil particles in which the plants grow. But these ions are not usually present in very high concentrations in that soil water. And typically, they're found in much higher concentrations inside the cells of the plant's roots. And therefore, they need to be transported against their concentration gradient from the soil water where they're in low concentration to within the plant's cells in the roots where they're in a comparatively higher concentration. So one of the ways in which the rate of transport of these ions and also of water into the roots is maximized is by providing a large surface area for the roots and this is done because the roots uh, or by means of root hairs which are these tiny hair-like projections which come off the surfaces of the roots so if we look at these uh, in uh, more detail in a photograph, the root may appear a bit like this. It has these root hairs projecting from the surfaces of it. And these root hairs provide a very large surface area over which osmosis and also the active transport of mineral ions can take place. Here we can see some of these root hairs examined under a microscope here. We can see the cells of the surface of the root. Here we can see the root hairs projecting uh, above the surface of the root here. So because there are lots of air spaces between the soil particles, there's this abundance of oxygen present for the root hairs to carry out aerobic respiration. Now this provides the energy necessary for the ions to be transported against their concentration gradient by active transport. This is sometimes called active diffusion, but really this is a bit more of an old fashioned term. These days, active transport is the term which is used more, more widely. So in plant cells, the cell membranes of these root hairs have special carrier proteins which allow the movement of these mineral ions by active transport against their concentration gradients. So let's summarize what we've said so far about the movement of substances across membranes. Diffusion is defined as the net movement of particles down their concentration gradient. In other words, from a region where the particles are in high concentration to a region where they're in low concentration. Osmosis is a special case of diffusion which involves the net movement of water molecules from where the water molecules are in high concentration to where they are in low concentration through a partially permeable membrane. Active transport is a method by which cells can move particles from where, where they are in low concentration across a membrane to where they are in high concentration, that is to say against their concentration gradient. And this requires energy which is produced by the process of cellular respiration. So a really important factor in a number of different biological processes is the ratio between the surface area of structures and the volume of those structures. So let's take a look at some examples of that now. So single celled organisms such as amoeba and also some algae, they have very high surface area to volume ratios. Now this means that dissolved substances don't have to travel very far at all to get into or out of the organism. Now in these cases, the process of diffusion is adequate enough to supply the organism with all the materials that it needs, such as oxygen and nutrients, and also to remove the waste products that it's producing, such as carbon dioxide. Now the reason for this is because the distance over which the materials have to diffuse is relatively short. This is called the diffusion path. Now diffusion 
um, is the rate of diffusion, the speed at which particles will diffuse, is closely related to the in inverse of the diffusion path. The shorter the diffusion path is, the faster the rate of diffusion. So, for example, there is a lower concentration of oxygen inside the amoeba due to the aerobic uh, respiration taking place in its metabolism, and also a higher concentration of oxygen in the surrounding water. So oxygen diffuses into the body of the amoeba, into its cytoplasm, down its concentration gradient, across the whole cell surface membrane. Conversely, there's a greater concentration of carbon dioxide inside the amoeba, again because of cellular respiration, than there is outside in the surrounding water. And so carbon dioxide will diffuse in the opposite direction across the cell surface membrane of the amoeba. Now diffusion as a result of this is actually a very good mechanism to move substances down their concentration gradients across cells and it's sufficient to suit the needs of single-celled organisms such as amoeba. But when you start to get larger, um, organisms can't rely on diffusion alone to meet the needs uh, of nutrients and oxygen and also for the removal of wastes. The reason for this is because of the uh, decrease in the surface area to volume ratio. So to illustrate what we mean by surface area vo uh, to volume ratio and to illustrate how this changes with changing sizes, let's take a look at this kind of hypothetical example here. So this cube has edges of one millimeter in length. And so all the sides of the cube are one millimeter in length. So the surface area to volume ratio of this cube is six to one because the total surface area is the total surface of all of the sides of the cube. There are six sides and each cube has um, a side in this, or this cube has each side uh, one times one uh, millimeters squared. Uh, which is one millimeter squared. So since each of the sides of the cube are one square millimeter in area and there are six sides, the total surface area of this cube is six millimeters squared. Now to calculate the volume of this cube, we multiply its width times its height times its depth. So it's one times one times one, giving a total volume of one cubic millimeter. So the ratio of surface area to volume for this cube is six to one. If we now increase the size of this cube to one that has sides of two millimeters, let's have a look at what effect that has on the surface area to volume ratio here. So the total surface area of this cube is going to be the six sides times the surface area of each side. And the surface area of each side is two times two millimeters, giving a total surface area of 24 square millimeters. Now, if we try and work out the volume of this cube, it's going to be two times two times two, which gives a total volume of eight cubic millimeters. So we see here that the surface area to volume ratio of this cube is 24 to eight, which simplifies to three to one. So we see here that doubling the, um, the length of the sides of this cube uh, has the effect of reducing the surface area to volume ratio by a factor of two. So what implications does this have for the rate of movement of dissolved substances? Well, let's have a look now at what happens when we look at a cube with sides of three millimeters. So this cube will have a total surface area of 54 millimeters squared and a total volume of 27 cubic millimeters. Now this is a ratio of two to one. So let's summarize these findings then. So if we increase the length of the sides of a cube, uh, from one to two to three to four millimeters, we can see that the surface area to volume ratio decreases, but not in a linear fashion. As the length of the sides of, a, uh, of this cube increase, then the surface area and volume will both increase exponentially, but the ratio of the surface area to the volume um, increases uh, in such a way because the volume increases at a greater rate than the surface area. And so this gives us a surface area to volume ratio that decreases exponentially like this. Now, what this means is that as the size of, the, uh, of a structure or of an organism increases, the surface area does not increase in proportion to the volume. So multicellular organisms have a smaller surface area in relation to their total volume than un unicellular organisms. And for this reason, 
Diffusion alone across the surface of the body is not sufficient to deliver all of the nutrients and oxygen and also to get rid of all of the carbon dioxide and other waste products um, that that organism either requires or produces. So multicellular organisms have evolved very complex transport systems, such as our circulatory system, for example, to carry the dissolved substances they need around the body to the individual cells of their bodies in order to sustain their lives. So it, for this reason also, exchange surfaces, such as the surface inside the lungs, the surfaces of the alveoli, have also become highly modified to increase the surface area to volume ratio. So it's not just the size, it's also the shape of an object which determines its surface area to volume ratio. So, so far we've been looking at cubes. Let's now consider tubular and cubic structures. So both of these structures have a total volume of eight cubic millimeters. We have a cube of side two millimeters, and we also have this elongated tubular structure, which has a height and a width of one millimeter and a depth of eight millimeters. Both of these have a volume of eight cubic millimeters, but the surface area of this elongated structure is 34 millimeters squared in comparison to the surface area of this cube, which is uh, 24 millimeters squared. And so we can say that the surface area to volume ratio of this elongated structure is higher than the surface area to volume ratio of this cuboidal structure, which has the same volume. Now, it's for this reason that whenever you have a surface over which diffusion or other forms of transport are happening, such as, for example, the um, the villi and the microvilli inside the digestive system in the small intestine, you find these finger-like projections which massively will increase that surface area to aid more efficient uh, absorption of substances by diffusion. So gas and solute exchange surfaces, for example, the gas exchange surfaces in the lungs and also the solute exchange surfaces in, on the surface of the uh, small intestine, these are structurally adapted to maximize the rate of exchange of materials across those surfaces. And many of these surfaces have some of the same adaptations. Firstly, they are all large surface areas which typically are moist. They are either covered with a layer of fluid like the surface area of the alveoli in the lungs, or they are in contact with the fluid like they are in the small intestine. They also have a very well-developed transport system for the dissolved absorbed chemicals. And this is, for example, in uh, the circulatory system in animals and also the vascular system of plants serves this function. There's also usually a good system of ventilation and control where the gases need to be exchanged. And so in our case, that is the mechanism of ventilation or breathing. And in the case of plants in the leaves, you have the stomata, the openings on the undersides of the leaves. Where there are dissolved minerals being exchanged between two different solutions with a membrane between them, typically there is a counter current flow um, mechanism where the fluids are flowing past each other in opposite directions on either side of that membrane and this maximizes the rate of diffusion as well. <clears throat> so all human organs and body systems have characteristic features which enable them to efficiently exchange the substances that are required as well as the substances which are produced as a result of cellular metabolism. There's a couple of good examples here of the respiratory system, which is designed for the efficient exchange of oxygen into the blood versus carbon dioxide out of the blood. So if we take a look inside the lungs, we'll find inside the lungs, there are these uh, microscopic air sacs called alveoli. Now, the, you find these at the ends of the airway system. So you have the trachea, which divides into the two bronchi, left and right. Those bronchi divide into finer and finer tubes called bronchioles, which eventually end in these alveolar air sacs. The other example that I've mentioned is the lining of the small intestine, which is designed to maximize the rate of absorption of digested substances into the blood. So if we were to look here, we would find a transverse section of the small intestine might look something like this. Here we can see the villi, which are folds and finger-like projections of the inner surface, the lining of the small intestine. But if we were to look at these under a microscope, their surfaces would also have microscopic finger-like projections called microvilli. 
So small soluble molecules, which are the end products of digestion, such as glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, and glycerol, these will diffuse across from the contents of the small intestine through the lining of the small intestine and directly into the blood or into the lymphatic system. So in mammals, some of the end products of digestion are absorbed from the small intestine into the blood by active transport. An example of this is glucose. And again, this is done by special carrier proteins, which are embedded in the membranes of the cells lining the small intestine. So the villi in the small intestine are the small finger-like projections into which the lining of the small intestine is folded to maximize the total surface area available for absorption by diffusion and active transport. So again, if we look at the inner lining of the small intestine, we see that it's folded into these many projections called villi to maximize its surface area. But if we look at these villi in detail under a microscope, we might see that they, they themselves have certain structural adaptations which make them particularly good for absorption across their surfaces. So for example, you have these very highly branched networks of blood capillaries inside the villi, and these are present to absorb the molecules um, of digested food substances directly into the blood at the maximum rate possible. You also have these glands between the villi, which are responsible for producing many of the digestive enzymes and secretions which are released into the small intestine. And we also have a muscle layer surrounding the small intestine, which is responsible for the wave-like rhythmic contractions which move foods along the small intestine called peristalsis. Now we're going to be looking at these structures and also the structures of the digestive system and its function in, in more detail in later lessons of this GCSE biology course. <clears throat> so here again is that transverse section of a small intestine. Here are the villi and this is the lumen, the inner cavity of the small intestine. So if we were to examine this uh, uh, under more detail on a microscope, we could actually see the individual villi and if we were to examine the surface of the villus under more magnification still, we could see that each cell is lined with a so-called brush border of microvilli. These are microscopic finger-like projections on the surfaces of these villi, which again increase the surface area available for absorption. So each villus has an extensive capillary network and also a lacteal, which is a vessel in the middle connected to the lymphatic system, which absorbs lipids. The villus epithelium, the layer of cells which lines the outside of each villus, is very thin, and this pr provides a very thin diffusion path uh, over which the uh, molecules have to diffuse, and this increases the rate of diffusion, as we said before. <clears throat> So if we look at the various layers of um, that make up the small intestine, we have layers of muscle, which are responsible for the peristaltic motion, which moves the food along. We also have the villi, and the surfaces of each villus are lined with an epithelium, on the edges of which you find these microvilli. You also have various secretory cells called goblet cells, which produce a thin covering of mucus over the surfaces of the villi as well. And of course, you have the capillaries and the lacteal that we mentioned before, together with the very extensive network of uh, capillary blood vessels as well. So again, these products of digestion, sugars, amino acids, these diffuse from where they are in high concentration in the fluid contents of the small intestine through the walls of each villus into where they are in comparatively lower concentration. And so they are moving down a concentration gradient. Now, some substances are actively transported, such as glucose. Oil droplets, fatty acids, and glycerol diffuse into the lacteal and not into the blood vessels. And the lacteal is part of another uh, system of tubes distributed throughout the body called the lymphatic system. Okay, everyone, that's going to do it for this lesson. I hope that was useful to you. I'm going to go into the Q&A discussion segment now with the students who are in attendance, and I will see you in the next one. Take care.